And as we're going to be spending time in God's word, we would like everyone to have a copy of God's word in your hand. So go ahead and raise your hand if you don't have a copy. And the men here will make sure that you get a copy in your hands. This morning, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 3, specifically verses 12 through 14. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. This morning in our scripture reading, we read through this passage and the surrounding context. The beginning of this context was in verses 7 through 11. And it started off by quoting Psalm 95, which itself was looking back and referencing the Exodus. It looks back to when the Israelites provoked God in the wilderness. God made promises to the Israelites that were in Egypt. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 8, he told them that he would deliver them from the Egyptians and bring them out of the land of, and into the land of the Canaanites. The land that he had promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How did the Israelites respond to those promises? To those promises of God? We just have to read through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy to find out. They tried and tested God. They rebelled against God, even though they clearly saw God's miraculous work for 40 years. And here in our context, in chapter 3, verse 10, it says that the Israelites always went astray in their hearts. They did not know his ways. And jumping ahead to the end of our context in verses 18 and 19, God says those who were disobedient did not enter his rest because of unbelief. Let's think about that for a moment. That's actually kind of staggering to think about. The people of Israel did not believe. This first generation of Israelites were eyewitnesses of God's work. They saw God lay waste to Egypt with the 10 plagues. They saw God protect them with a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire as they left Egypt. They saw God divide the Red Sea such that they walked on dry land. They saw God take bitter waters and make them sweet. And they saw God miraculously feed them with manna every single day. They had a daily reminder of God's work in their lives. And there were many more of these things. What did the people of Israel not believe? They clearly believed that God existed. They weren't atheists. They saw that he was powerful to do miraculous things. They saw and witnessed those things firsthand. But their wandering, hard hearts did not trust God and take him at his word. They did not believe God's promises and did not trust that he, in the way that he would fulfill his promises. When things got hard and didn't go the way they wanted or expected, they grumbled, they complained, they rebelled. And through their disobedience, their unbelief became evident. Now let's take a closer look at our specific patches this morning, verses 12 through 14. Please follow along as I read Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. See to it, brothers, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ, if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. With the hard-hearted Israelites of the Exodus as the backdrop, the author of Hebrews provides a sobering warning here in verse 12. He commands this primarily Jew Jewish audience to see to it, watch out, take care, brothers. He wants these brothers, these professing believers, to be on guard, to be on guard that there would not be in any one of them an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. The danger of unbelief stems from a wicked heart that refuses to trust God and falls away. And this falling away is not some passive kind of action. It's an act of withdrawing, departing, abandoning the living God because of unbelief in the heart. 
How do believers guard against this unbelief? Let's look at the beginning of verse 13. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today. Believers are commanded to encourage, to exhort, to come alongside each other every day. With what do we come alongside each other? The content needs to be what is true about God and his promises. It's encouraging and exhorting each other with God's word to believe and obey God's word. Why? Why is this necessary? Let's look at the second half of verse 13. So that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Sin wants to mislead, deceive, entice you to believe something that's not true about God or his word. Sin's effects on the heart will be to harden it. It will cause the heart to stubbornly resist truth. Believers need to be reminded about what is true in Christ. Let's look at the beginning of verse 14. For we have become partakers of Christ. Believers have become participants in and sharers in Christ. This is about the new ongoing relationship that believers now have with Christ because and only because of their faith. So so what is this relationship all about? It's about the gospel. It's about the good news and the reality that a holy God, a perfect holy God, and that every person, every, every person that's ever lived, every human is a sinner and has rebelled against him and fully deserves a just penalty for their sins. And God, in his grace and mercy, sent his son Jesus to the Messiah to take on flesh for the purpose of going to the cross, to suffer and die, to be the wrath-satisfying sacrifice for sins. Jesus takes the penalty for sin so that his people can be righteous, so that they can have a right relationship to God and they get to be with him forever. All true believers partake of Christ in this way. I say all true believers because not everyone that professes to be a believer is in fact a believer. Let's look at the last half of verse 14. If we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. There's a condition attached to the truth of sharing in Christ. Those that are truly sharers in Christ are the ones that continue to cling to the objective realities of the gospel from the very beginning all the way to the end until they die. This is not trusting in a profession and holding on to a subjective experience. And it's certainly not trusting in ourselves. This is putting all your trust and all your confidence in Christ and in the realities of what he alone accomplished at the cross. This truth should give us pause. We know from Mark chapter 4 where Jesus teaches on the parable of the soils and from 1 John 2, 19 where the apostle says, they went out from us, but they were not really of us. That a profession is not necessarily indicative of true saving faith in Christ. So how does one know if a profession may be false? Verses 18 and 19 make it clear that disobedience and unbelief go hand in hand. The unbelief of the Israelites was made evident by their disobedience. Disobedience is rooted in and an expression of unbelief. In a moment, we're going to take a piece of bread that represents Christ's body and we're, that was given, and we're going to take a cup of juice that represents his blood that was shed. This is a time for believers, for those that cling to and follow Christ to remember him and to proclaim his death. However, this is just a time for believers. If you would, by your own admission, say that you do not believe and follow Christ, then we ask that when the tray comes by, that you would simply let it pass by. But please don't let this moment pass you by. Do not harden your hearts as the Israelites did. You've had the good news proclaimed to you. Don't trust in yourself. Trust in him. Cling to him. 
please talk to me or any one of the other pastors or the person that brought you. We would love to discuss what saving faith in Christ is all about. Believer, be encouraged with the truth of God and his word. You have become a partaker in Christ and share in all of those gospel realities. Rejoice in what he has accomplished on the cross. And when your hearts are prepared, go ahead and take these elements on your own.